In the center of Masjid al-Haram in Makkah, Saudi Arabia stands the holiest shrine in Islam, the Holy Kaaba. The Holy Kaaba is the spiritual center of Islam. Thus, gathering in the house of the Almighty is very important to Muslims. But recently, strange things kept appearing at the Kaaba, making even the most stable people feel confused. That was the moment when Muslims praying around the Kaaba were stunned and shocked when thousands of strange insects invaded the Kaaba. Confusion appeared on everyone's faces. They began to pray frantically as if fear was taking over their minds. Citizens living around the Kaaba have expressed that they have never seen such a thing in their lives. Experts in the region have also stated that they have never seen such insects that surround the Kaaba. The city government said it will focus its search and treatment on insect breeding areas around the Kaaba, in all toilets in the mosque's courtyards, open water sources, and wastewater. These comments make Muslims even more afraid. They honestly don't know what the heck is going on. Everyone was divided into many opinions about this sudden appearance of insects. Experts reminded that some people in the Arabian Peninsula have raised bugs for the bird's nest and that these insects may have come from the Arabian Peninsula. Some people confidently declare that it is just a very normal natural phenomenon. But you should remember this is a phenomenon that was seen for the first time. As people gradually calmed down, they became more alert to consider what was the true origin of these animals appearing at the Kaaba. Of course, that's not a coincidence. And what species are these strange insects? Has it ever revealed itself before? Are they warning something? We invite you to stay until the end of the video to see what horrors are happening in the Kaaba. And no matter what the reason is that Islam is facing terrible events, even if they do not have the same faith as us, we, the children of God, should live according to the word. He taught, put love above all things and pray for them. But before we go looking for light on all the above questions, Let's test your memory with the following question to see how much you understand about the Bible. The question is, in the book of Exodus, what is one of the plagues that God sent upon Egypt, including a swarm of destructive insects? A. Flies. B. Bees. C. Locusts. D. Ants. Time to think. Time ups. It's quite easy, right? The reason I mention locust is because it is one of the insects that is said to have appeared at the Kaaba and made Muslims extremely confused. And this is also the insect that appeared in the Bible, and it represents punishment. Therefore, the connection with what has been mentioned in the Bible and its appearance at this time makes people tremble even though they do not want to. Why did this sign appear in the Kaaba and not elsewhere in the world? Truly something worth pondering. The first reason is about the faith. Muslims do not believe in Jesus, their true savior. According to Muslim belief, Jesus, the son of Mary, is one of the greatest messengers of God. Yes, not the son, but the messenger. Muslims believe things about Jesus, not because of the Bible or any other religion, but simply because the Holy Quran says these things about him. However, Muslims always emphasize that the miracles of Jesus and all other prophets were by God's permission. This having been said, many Christians feel to not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, God incarnate, or the third person of the Trinity. This is because the Qur'an clearly says that Almighty God does not have a son, neither allegorically, physically, or metaphorically. They rejected the true Messiah. Is that why Jesus was angry? The second reason is that Muslims have violated God's will. The Bible, God's words, and God's actions all lead His people toward love God, love people. The two precepts form an inseparable whole and are the two fundamental principles of all ethics. The gospel that Jesus wants to spread to everyone is love. Meanwhile, 
Quran tends to promote violence and extremist beliefs. And God does not like this at all because it is against his will. In recent years, most armed conflicts have taken place in Muslim countries. Muslim countries are also overrepresented among countries with high levels of other forms of internal violence. They also have a higher than average participation in interstate conflicts. That's why God became more and more angry, and he had no choice but to use signs to warn people. And the coming of locusts is one of these signs. And what will happen if we deliberately ignore the signs of the appearance of insects? Might you remember that locusts emerge more than any other insect as agents of destruction in the Bible? Descending in swarms, they ravage crops and strip the land bare. And that is also the eighth plague in Egypt. Locusts strip the land bare, destroying grain, vines, fig trees, and other agriculture. Locusts destroy everything, highlighting how insects can rapidly bring barrenness, loss, and suffering. The eighth plague is close to the most plague when God descended on Egypt. So, witnessing a Kaaba surrounded by locusts made them unable to help but recall the horrors described in the Bible. Is that day coming back? The day of punishment and judgment? If we deliberately ignore these signs, will we also face terrible things, similar to what happened to the Egyptians? Everything is completely destroyed. Maybe in the Bible, the appearance of locusts is the eighth plague, but in this life, these are likely just the first signs. If people continue to disobey and do not listen to God's call, then naturally, plagues will continuously be inflicted until the final plague takes effect. Everything is too late now. Besides locusts, the Old Testament deploys maggots, mildew, and other insects as instruments of destruction and judgment. But, throughout Scripture, locusts constitute an instrument of God to humble the people and call them back to righteous living. Their emergence is a call to reflection and repentance. Back to the story where God brought plague on Egypt to deliver the Israelites from slavery. God brings plague to save his people. But he also did not kill the Egyptians at once. He gave them time to reflect and repent by dropping plagues on them one by one. Just like now, God does not cause plagues to harm his children. But he is showing signs to hope that those who have gone astray can turn back. In Exodus 12-12, God adds that he was doing something else very important. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. So the judgments God would carry out would be, on a certain level, against the Egyptian gods. In doing this, he would teach a lesson to both the Egyptians and the Israelites, who by now had been in Egypt for a number of generations and had drifted far from the religion of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, optimistically believe that the appearance of locusts at the Kaaba has not caused any harm. So it is probably just sending a message of some sort, a message of repentance and returning to God. Rotting seeds under clods of earth show God's hand against the people to spark repentance. Maybe they don't know what they are doing, but now they have experienced many things, including very clear signs of this insect. So whether they like it or not, Muslims need to be very calm and consider everything, possibility, and be alert to see which is your best way back. If they don't realize God's empower as soon as possible, the plagues were much worse than they normally would have been. So let's notice each plague, and then see some of the other gods or goddesses the true God was executing judgment against. All the information shows how insects prominently feature in the biblical narrative as metaphors for evil, destruction, and judgment. Their destructive potential provides vivid object lessons in the wages of sin. Yet God remains sovereign over the infestations, directing them to spur repentance and refinement. Though the buzzing swarms and creeping, crawling hordes arise for inflicting destruction, God's faithful may take comfort that they remain in His hands. For believers, these judgments prompt purification. Through the lens of Scripture, even evil insects operate in the service of God. 
That is why I sincerely ask you to join me in praying for Muslims, for their return so that they will know who their real Savior is. Lord Jesus, protect and defend your children as they are bring surrounded by Antichrist, children of darkness and haters. Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father, the Great Spirit, or whatever else. We worship Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Worship Him in spirit and in truth, ruler of the universe. Please let them come to their senses only after the first calamities, so that they do not have to go through much suffering, but still receive God's grace. But in a sadder scenario, what if the appearance of these insects is a sign of the end times? Old Testament plagues take new forms in the 21st century. That might be the COVID pandemic. Instead of swarming locusts destroying crops, an infectious disease attacks our bodies and has killed people. Or they might be earthquakes in China, a cyclone in Burma, killer tornadoes and record floods across the U.S., and even a plague of locusts in New England. And now, we ourselves do not know what is quietly brewing around us and waiting to explode. Nobody know. The book of Revelation graphically depicts health and environmental devastation in the end times. Boils on people, waters turning to blood, drought, darkness, a global earthquake. Doctrine and Covenants Chapter 84, verses 96 to 98 puts it this way, For I, the Almighty, have laid my hands upon the nations to scourge them for their wickedness, and plagues shall go forth, and they shall not be taken from the earth until I have completed my work, which shall be cut short in righteousness until all shall know me who remain, even from the least unto the greatest. So what lessons should we learn from the appearance of insects in the Bible and in the Kaaba today? 1. We must realize that God takes sin very seriously. The severity of the plagues in Egypt mentioned in the Bible, and even the questionable signs that appeared at the Kaaba, show how seriously God took their sins. He hates all sin. We should never minimize sin in our lives, of course. Every sin is serious, and if we do not repent, it will lead to eternal death. 2. God is patient, giving us time to repent. But a good sign is that God loves people more than anything. He gives warnings to hope that people will soon awaken, but His patience will eventually run out. What followed was God's terrifying judgment. May we and all of them turn back and repent before that happens. 3. Many people turn to God in a time of calamity, but when things get better, they almost immediately turn away again. This is extremely dangerous. Their hearts are hardened again. We may wonder how Pharaoh could have been so blind and stupid as to harden his heart so many times. But the fact is, Pharaoh wasn't all that unusual. When the pressure was on, he relented and said he would let the Israelites go. But as soon as the pressure was off, his heart was hardened again. And it's the same in the present. Many people will feel frightened when they see the plagues God brings. They will be afraid and will look to God for comfort right in that moment. But when all danger passed, they were once again separated from God's arms. 4. God is trying to get our attention. Are we listening? Remember that the Israelites were victims of the first three plagues along with the Egyptians. God had to shake them up and get their attention so He could begin separating them from the world to make them His chosen nation. The news happening around us now should serve to wake us up. God not only sent a message to the Kaaba, but also sent a message to Christians wanting us to join in praying for the Kaaba, for the Muslims, asking for their return to Him. 5. God requires obedience, not just belief. How were the Israelites spared from the death of the firstborn? Yes, they had to trust, and then they had to act. They had to do something. They had to put the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorposts. They had to act and obey in faith or they would have lost their firstborn as the Egyptians did. Obedience here means that we must follow God's teachings. 
that is putting love for God and people above all else, rather than always having potential confrontation and violence. 6. Our all-powerful God is in complete control. We see this throughout the plagues. God controlled every aspect of it to bring about His purpose of delivering His people from slavery and sin to make a new nation of them. We can take great comfort and hope in that. Nothing is out of His control. He has begun a good work in us and will continue that work in us so long as we are receptive and open to Him and allow Him to continue that work. While tragedies such as a locust swarm are not always a sign of God's judgment on a community, but the invasion of locusts was a call for God's people to repent in fasting and sackcloth. Still today, when sign strikes, it can be a reminder to turn to God. God can use tragedies and the loss of material things to cause people to seek Him. Talking about the end times. First, concerning their nature, apocalyptic revelations can be divided into two distinct types. One type consists of events that will transpire unconditionally. That is, nothing can stop them from happening. Many of these are positive parts of God's plan for the salvation of His children. For example, the latter-day restoration of the gospel, its spread throughout the world, the consequent gathering of Israel, and the second coming of the Lord and His millennial reign. The other type of prophecies consists of events that will come about only if certain human conditions are met. Interestingly, every frightening prophecy falls into this category. What that means is that these calamities need not come to pass, provided conditions that would otherwise trigger them do not happen. A dire prophecy in the Book of Mormon seems to illustrate this point. Three times in Thur's Nephi chapter 16, 20 and 21, Jesus warns that if the, if the Gentiles do not repent after the blessing which they shall receive, after they have scattered my people, then shall a remnant of the house of Jacob go forth among them, like a young lion among a flock of sheep that both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Unfortunately, it would appear that most of the other dire prophecies will not have such a positive ending, and thus the world may yet see plenty of plagues, pestilences, and pests. And why? One of the most frightening insights in answer to this question is found in the book of Revelation. In chapters 8 and 9, using the power of apocalyptic symbolism, John records the vast devastations that will take place preceding the second coming. These fall into two categories. The first is the collapse of the natural order, bringing with it huge destructions, and the second is the ensuing wars. After describing the slaughter these wars will bring, the revelation of the Apostle John states that the rest of humankind who had not been killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so that they would not worship the demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood that cannot see, hear, or walk, and they did not repent of their murders, drug use, immorality, or stealing. It is that hard-heartedness, that total recalcitrance, and that desperate clinging to an immoral lifestyle, even in the face of its consequences, that brings about the devouring of the nations by plague, pestilence, and pests. We recall the statement by Paul, found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, to that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce-breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The real shame and sorrow of the danger and ruin that follows such lifestyles is that the prophesied horror need not happen if members of society as a whole would just repent. We will not be able to know exactly when God will come, but one thing is certain, he is showing signs for those who have left him 
to regain their sanity and return to him.